So querying a KDB um, database here. So the integration to H2O is just in its earliest uh, phases, um, obviously. You're probably going to see an experiment out of it. So the idea for us is at the moment, we have a simple KDB connector um, with a simple demo. I'm not sure how visible it is, but classic um, case stuff. We'll start with time series. I think the key part of time series and, and almost start the story from where the story needs to be told. Um, it's actually one of our new machine learning interpretability, MLI's interpretability for us. The prediction um, on this front is, this is actually predicting uh, weekly sales prediction. And the mismatch is what we want to know why. I think we, were, we stopped at the why um, a minute ago on the New York taxi data. By the way, um, the New York taxi data um, is one of the data science contest that driverless AI almost effortlessly got in the top 10. So for the, it's a Kaggle contest on predicting how the duration of a trip. And so we actually trained our um, automatic machine learning platform to make sure it performs on par, about close to on par with real grandmasters. And, and I think all the hard work that we saw earlier can be automated um, in, a, in a few, um, few strokes of, of um, Python or, or, or on, on screen. I'll demo some of that product today. But, but the, suffice to say, it's not just the prediction. People want to know why uh, a particular prediction is the way it is. In this case, we're looking at uh, our product, the S&P 500 data that we looked at earlier. Um, we want to look at why the Apple stock is being predicted to be here. and um, and I think the interesting nuance is Shapley is a game theoretic technique that allows you to break down the dimensions which matter for the prediction. So I think um, eventually it all boils down to the story, right? So if you're able to tell a very good story from the model, in this particular case, is it a holiday or not? Or is it a warm day or not? You were trying to do the weather augmentation. I think a lot of that um, is, is where the story starts from. The art of science is going to be how well you can tell a story from the data science. Uh, I'm going to also talk about one other uh, piece, which is what other data sets should I bring to the table, right? That's a common problem. Um, and augmentation is uh, actually where the next rev of machine learning is going. It's once you, there's a classic, the mathematical no free lunch algorithm, not to say about pizza and it's time to get to dinner very soon, but um, augmenting data, new, bringing new data sets to the table is actually going to uplift the signal quite a bit. So I think that's the next phase and I think a lot of the data sets today are stored in, in different uh, KDB databases and so how do you bring them together? How do you then start building an augmentation, recommendation engine for augmentation? I think that's the next phase of where data science is headed. Finally, um, I'm going to start um, a small cat, a small model here, um, which um, which is a um, let me see if I have the data set. Um, how do you bring um, expand on the vocabulary? Right? Sort of any musical or mathematical system is is as good as its repertoire. So the base repertoire of a product is always going to be limited by how many people have worked in the core of the product. We want to expand that um, and go outside and get data scientists to participate on the canvas we created. Think of this as a canvas that uh, allows additional folks to come in and bring their own recipes, not just the ones we created for automatic machine learning, for transformations that you want to bring in and automate them. So I think then suddenly the product becomes more of a programmable platform 
and a middleware as opposed to a black box. And this is again bringing the community's brilliance into the space. Um, this again um, launched this experiment here. Um, there's some subtle nuances going on here. Uh, just to explain what's going, ha what's happening, we had three big knobs on accuracy, time, and interpretability. Interpretation, as I mentioned earlier, is about the how can I decode uh, the data to decode the decision, um, time, how much time we have, and obviously accuracy. The most common ask we see in a hedge fund scenario would be 10, 10, and 1. I, I have a lot of time. I don't really care about explaining it to someone else, but I want the most accuracy. Uh, in a regulated environment, if the decision making is more related to um, a lending or fair lending, uh, more precisely, or by or detecting, making sure you're not biased, that's when you see a higher interpretability score. And then finally, um, as you as this model keeps running, you'll see initially it's a genetic algorithm. So initially, um, it starts with the base base features. I'm gonna zoom in to kind of see the features. Um, the low previous day, high previous day, and a simple set of uh, transformations. I'm a huge fan of um, exponential, of, of moving averages in general, but exponential weighted moving average is a, is a good way to kind of, of to create uh, features on your time series data. The idea here is that these feature engineering um, will progressively start bringing accuracy Right, sort of uh, as we keep running this experiment, you see the feature um, train has gotten more and more you, uh, similar stocks that work, that are together cluster, um, and a portfolio is being formed. And you can see how over time this gene gets better and better at uh, the 3.04 is the RMSE, lower is better in this case, um, in the, root, in the root, root mean square error here. And it's also picked the right kind of model type, which is a gradient boosting method. XGBoost is a variation of the gradient boosting technique. Um, and, and the idea is that it became a very powerful um, engine to find the right algorithms for the models, for the problem at hand. Then we have um, typically data scientists build these models. They want to explain to someone, uh, I, I, we saw earlier Rebecca was trying to figure out who made that error. Um, in, in a bigger environment, it becomes a question of, of actually documenting what really is happening. Um, so we have um, a model that was built today, obviously, and you get a whole um, kind of a digital um, transcript for how the model was built in documented form. Um, this is a very um, key aspect of how models go to production. Um, data scientists spend a lot of time trying to do this, we want to save that time, you know, augment um, data scientists with a tool that builds that automatically. A lot of our customers work closely with us, and I've, in my audience, um, some of the some of the top um, customer-facing, customer experience people, uh, Kerry O'Shea from New York and uh, Josephine from Chicago, but from H2O. They work closely with customers to get to the right kind of specification that works for this. If you think, think of Citibank has its own way of looking at this versus Morgan Stanley. And the idea here is that to make it custom fit, snug fit it, uh, not, how, not just how you report it, but how you end up using the platform. So that's the other piece. Then finally, the, these models need to be deployed into production. So H2O is, the way to think about AI is it's in the business of converting data to code. And, um, and, and essentially building that code um, is roughly what we are doing um, with AI. And this is not um, just a function of um, today. Uh, AI is not a new, f new uh, phenomenon, right, as you can see. AI is, um, was expert systems, hardly 1980s, 90s. And in the expert systems world, AI was basically rule engines. And the last 20 years, or 20 years after that expert system era, we've been building rule engines. And what we're doing now with the current form of AI is statistically learning the data and producing rule engines for, for the software engineer. So essentially, the software engineer's code generation now becomes a form of um, understanding data. And, that's, um, and the purpose of most AI companies 
or all our companies are is going to be to understand how our customers what the, what their feedback is and based on that feedback we create new data and making new data becomes the purpose of almost all software and that's kind of the loop that allows you to create new code um, I want to jump to a few slides here but um, want to continue uh, to the point where we could essentially say a large part of the product has been walked through. Obviously, the exhaustic version of um, product demo that you saw earlier was quite um, powerful. Um, data, uh, data, science want, data scientists want to know out of the box what what is my data, right? Sort of, and so heat map is a common technique to do that. So this uh, this is an auto visualization tool chain. Uh, kind of, this is doing ANOVA, essentially trying to figure out what are the connections in, in, in the data at different levels of strength. Um, again, uh, look present outliers, right? Sort of how do you look at outliers in your data? And um, a point here is a large part of data today is still, un still um, untagged, unlabeled. So a lot of the unsupervised learning techniques I have need, need to catch up so we can start building data that is more um, more ready for supervised learning. So AutoViz, um, and finally, I think the bulk of, um, bulk of where we come from is deploying this data back into production. And I think that starts with being able to generate that code. Uh, and historically, H2O in the open source um, it's our claim to fame is ability to generate JIT code that is low latency and is capable of going into production. Um, and, and that's actually how we got really successful is to go beyond just the science part and generate code that actually can go into production. And this is the scoring engines. And in the H2O driverless AI, we produce the entire pipeline, including the transformation and the scoring engine. So that's kind of um, the mojo or the pojo in this scenario. Um, and in the queue-centric world, we want to produce this code in, in queue so you can then start running these scoring engines on the KDB instance as, itself, so in database scoring. So the way to think about that whole transformation is we start with model building and then generate the code, what we call mojo, and that code then runs on the edge or runs where the data is being created, where the apps are. In the K uh, world, this would essentially be KX being used on the, as the back end for running learning and then building the mojo in a format that can be understood by the, I mean, by the KDB system. And then finally, we actually think that learning, right now we're doing scoring on the edge where the app is. I think learning is going to actually emerge on the edge as well, where you can start not only using this feedback loop, but also start learning at the edge. So I think these are the three where, where, where places where we are beginning to build that bridge between the two systems, AI and the KDB for time series. A lot of the time series piece here is going to essentially be a, lot, a ton of feature engineering that needs to be pushed down. I mean, obviously most of us have further the push down predicates. We need to go all the way, make some of these queue, but also native to KDB. And then this, the performance will stand up to the rate at which data is coming. A large number of the techniques have to be adapted as well, because what we can do at a, in, in situ cannot be done in action. And so in the high speed, high streaming environments, we we'll probably have to resort to simpler functions, simpler transformations, and eke out the best signal that the data has. Talk about how H2O, I mean, this is uh, New York. We've been quite fortunate for a reception in New York and London over the last six, nine months. Um, we've basically come back to a very roomful thanks to having us here. But I think um, the H2O open source essentially has been on a tear of adoption over the last six years. And um, we think we count about 18,000 companies in our user base. Um, and uh, these, these are data scientists using us almost continuously. It's a necessary skill set for doing data science today. We plugged into other open source frameworks like Python, Spark, and R. And, and I think that's been kind of one of the core um, piece. We've done meetups like this for 
the best part of the existence of the company. In fact, our product roadmaps were completely announced at meetups and improved at each meetup. So hopefully by the next meetup, we'll have a much more deeper, um, at least one of those three boxes we'll be able to showcase for the KX H2O piece. Um, a large chunk of how we got here is, is the work of the team. The physics of the team uh, is the physics of the product. In fact, the teams that are behind H2O, we started with a strong compiler um, team at the center, and, uh, and so we understand hardware, software, and how hardware needs to be very close to software. AI is transforming a large part of hardware as well. So there's GPU, CPU, and FPGA, and we're beginning to improve the core uh, capabilities on all these platforms. Then we have the physics folks. Um, someone said Kelvin, and um, I kind of, it gives away that people are uh, physicists. So we'll, we are, if, how many physicists in the audience? We are hiring. Um, and in New York. Um, so we can't have enough of physics systems thinkers. And we actually work very closely with mathematicians, um, but every math for every mathematician I walked up to and said, I, I need to distribute a generalized linear model or a gradient boosting machine, said it's impossible, right? So, and, and there's a couple, the ones who actually invented it said, this is, yes, this can be done, but everyone else said this will invalidate my PhD thesis, right? So we actually set, settled with physicists and they turned out to be very practical and, um, and actually managed to eke out the numerically closest approximation to the, to the theoret theoretical um, perfection, right? So as a result, uh, physicists uh, abound in the, in the company and these physicists started working and building stuff that data scientists started using. I remember distinctly we were at a Tableau conference and we had 759 downloads that day and we had our just new VP of marketing. And then I was asking the VP of marketing, is it Tableau? Is it um, you or something else that led to the downloads? Of course, the downloads were caused by us winning a Kaggle contest. And, uh, and a gentleman who now works for us, Dimitri Larko, uh, had written a blog post on how he won the contest using H2O. So grandmasters actually uh, defined how the products were being used in the field. And so we started now working closely with them and improving our product, that feedback loop, we wanted to keep it so tight. So we, we brought the customer in house. And so today we are home to the largest number of grandmasters in Kaggle. Grandmasters is this data science uh, team. If you win five equivalent of Olympic gold medals, you, you become a grandmaster. And there's about 10% 10, 10 of them today are at H2O. And they're constantly improving the automatic machine learning recipes so that data scientists everywhere can use the best um, practices, whether to prevent overfitting or to prevent leakage of test and train, or to then take this um, machine and start improving it. So time series, which is the theme of the day, text and, um, and transactional data is where we ended up really amplifying the grandmaster's work. And over the course of the next few uh, epochs, so the last 18 months, we essentially included some of the best recipes in there. About um, 10,000 people have downloaded the product over the last year, and a good 20% um, of them have given us feedback on how it worked for them or did not, which means we have hundreds of use cases where today this has hit the mark, and it continues to improve because of the fundamentally a community-centric way we have built the product. The product managers for this company, this, for the company, are the customers. We rarely have had anyone titled seriously as a product manager because customers are giving the best ideas that we are then productizing in many ways and building a platform. Um, the, the complex chart here uh, on the straight line there is the open source line where H2O and Sparkling Water are doing cluster-based computing. And the line here is where the intelligent driverless AI to do AI piece is being worked on and generating that code straight to build applications. At the back end of this is a database that we've worked on or the, uh, it has been worked on in the open source, almost inspired by KDB um, in, from, uh, by a gentleman by Matt Dahl, who actually was one of the earliest um, Q users and KX um, follower. And then now we are really fortunate for this partnership where we can now start bringing the best of both 
worlds and integrate them so you can then take it to much larger problems that all need to be solved. So that's um, the other piece that you typically hear is data is a team sport. And, and usually the idea is that the best business person uh, is really sitting next to the best engineer. Um, in order to get this to work right, small teams are going to be needed. Uh, cross teams, cross company teams, uh, partnerships, but partnerships between you and the customer, partnerships between you and the different groups within the company. We've seen at Visa, for example, several um, groups, groups of seven or eight were created, but the average age mandate for that was, supposed, was made to be 45, so that you can pick up a lot of young talent, but you need the culture of the company to be able to implement the output of the data science, which is changing the business processes. Finally, we have uh, time is an obvious only non-renewable resource, and we, we essentially try to speed things up, uh, which including includes the fact that um, KX stands for speed. Um, H2O has st stood for speed in the AI side, so it's, it only makes sense to bring the two products together. And time is of the essence here. One of my favorite slides um, on how um, uh, three things to learn from a child. Um, it's actually, uh, I like the last one. You have to cry for what you want. And you kind of, uh, I remember running into Niall Dalton in the first few weeks of being at Stanford trying to build this product. Niall was the first SC for work closely with Arthur. And we were trying to hope to mimic some of the APL stuff to get place and get the simplicity uh, of counting at scale. And we got some of that in H2O3 open source platform. But I think now we're fortunate, so ambitiously we're now here at customers trying to build this together again. So I'm quite looking forward to that. On, um, on fun, fun ways, um, you can also learn from a thief, apparently. Um, and seven things to learn from a thief. Um, to work at night, which most of us probably are staring at dark screens, um, if you cannot finish it on the first day, we have to absolutely come back for the, for the QVM the next day. Um, um, to love one's coworkers, as thieves would obviously do, and be willing to risk one's life for even a little thing. It seems so obvious, right? Sort of we lose our laptop and the guy sells it for $20 somewhere. Um, I think I like the number six, actually. AI has seen so many winters, and the last 100 years of AI has been actually, uh, to be brutally honest, a lot, lot of failure. And so we'll still be doing AI till, even, till it succeeds. And our purpose here is to, under, to underwrite the risk that you are taking when you're taking your first AI journeys. Our goal is to not um, to be the ecosystem, right? Sort of where you can grow, uh, be that trusted partner when you go into the AI journey. And we are here for you. Finally, um, and I started with joy. I said joy is so important. Um, it's not easy. It, it's it's good to acquire the best talent in the world, but let's not destroy their joy in their code. Right, sort of whether it's difficult to understand Q for someone, for the manager, if the manager doesn't, the Dilbert manager doesn't like um, Q, let's not let them define what language gets used. I also think that Python, while it um, truly democratized entry level into coding, I think to, to rediscover joy in coding, one probably eventually needs to go all the way to Scheme or, or, or Lisp and understand from principles how we got here. And I think a lot of that um, is, is a matter of being open. A polyglot world is ahead. It's not going to go away. And we need to be able to kind of continue to learn from the previous generation's discoveries about code. And to be honest, 20 years ago, when we were coding, it was a lot more, lot more fun. And so and we want to continue to discover and keep that joy in coding. 